and I mean, with the with the, the GM cotton is a proven success. Ew. You know, the issue in India is counterfeiting. Ew. They've got their seed dealers who are crooked sometimes, Ew. and they sell them a bag of organic seed as GM seed, and uh, the farmer loses his shirt. That's right. But that has nothing to do with GM technology. That's right, exactly. That's, that's a policy issue. Yeah. yeah. You know, BT uh, is amazing. You know, you can go to the market, get a whole ear of corn without that being tip being cut off. Yeah. Why not? BT corn. Exactly. So, so what the heck, you know? Doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to No Ideas Media and welcome to another installment of Ideas Uncut. This is a series of interviews that I captured in 2015-2016 while filming No GMO the movie. The first leg of our filming trip was in Hawaii where I got to learn about the rainbow papaya. It's a particular variety of papaya that's been genetically engineered to be resistant to a disease called ring spot virus. So in this interview, I get to speak to one of the key members of the team that developed this genetically modified papaya, and his name is Ken Kamiya. Ken is a papaya farmer, and he was absolutely critical in the development of this rainbow papaya. And I kind of like this because we so often think of crop development and crop production as kind of like two separate things, right? Scientists and farmers. In reality, they're, they're not separate at all. Farmers are just as critical as the scientists when it comes to developing and trialing and testing new crops. You know, they can be so critical, in fact, that sometimes they might even get a crop named after them, like Ken did with his Kamiya papaya. Here's the interview. I hope you enjoy it. Good stuff. Right on. Hello, Ken. Hello. How are you? Fine. Good stuff. Where are we standing today? You're standing in my personal papaya field at my home here in Waikane, Hawaii. Thank you for allowing us to come to your home and talk to you. You're welcome. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Right on. So, uh, your daughter Joni has is, is, is kind of facilitated us meeting here. Right. And uh, we're here in Hawaii to talk a little bit about papaya. So can you explain to me a little bit about how the papayas we're seeing growing behind us came to be? Well, you know, in the early days uh, in, in Hawaii, when they were trying to develop agriculture, uh, there were a couple of scientists, USDA and the Bishop Museum, brought in, they brought seeds in from the Caribbean and uh, worked with some of those seeds. And those original seeds uh, turned out to be our local solo papaya. We're just going to hold for a second for the airplane. Okay, again, uh, the early seeds were introduced from the Caribbean by some of the scientists with USDA and the uh, Bishop Museum. Mm. And the seeds were planted in the manoa above the University of Hawaii. And uh, lo and behold, the papaya became a nice small fruit that was suitable for commercialization. And then uh, working with those fruits, the USDA people, and the scientists at the University of Hawaii, uh, developed uh, what they call the solo papaya for Hawaii. And this was the origination of the famous Hawaii papayas. And of course, later on, there were many uh, breeders who came in and worked with that breed and made several other crosses and developed other lines of papaya. Hmm. Okay, and then let's talk about these other lines of papaya. Okay. You, you walked me through it before. We right. have quite a few varieties. And right. They, they've all kind of come out of each other. So can you explain? Right, okay. Uh, you know, originally we had the solo papaya, which was one variety. And again, you know, a good detail about papaya is papaya is a geospecific, specific, you know. You can take a papaya, grow it on Oahu, take it to Oahu, Kau, Big Island, and it won't do well. But at the same time, you take a papaya that's been selected on the Big Island, bring it to Oahu, it doesn't do well. Mm. So it's very spe site specific. So the University of Hawaii worked with a lot of varieties and they came up with several varieties, you know, line five, line eight, line seven, uh, line uh, 77, line 45, and so forth. And in included in those were the yellow papayas and red papayas. Okay. And uh, we had red papayas. Now tell me a little bit about the market reception to red papayas. Okay, you know, in Hawaii, papaya is a staple. If you go to any sizable supermarket, they must have papayas because it's a staple. And so again, uh, but the people in Hawaii prefer the yellow papaya. They introduced the red papaya, I think back in the 60s and it never took off. Kauai believed in red papaya and they planted all the red papayas, but they never got off the ground. And one of the disadvantages of the red papaya is very susceptible to disease and insect. Hmm. So that never made it. Hmm. So right today, the yellow papaya is the premier papaya. It's the premier papaya. Now, tell me a little bit about ring spot virus because okay. there were some huge problems in the 80s here in Oahu. Oh, yeah. You know, um, we were all happy farmers going along, planting our own seeds, taking our own class, uh, selections and so forth. And all of a sudden, the uh, uh, papaya ring spot showed up. In my case, my first fields were in this area, and uh, I had a neighbor across the street, an old gentleman, 
who had a field across there and he had the papaya planting and then he came down with the virus there. And so, you know, I, I would go over to the, the old gentleman and I said, oh, you know, you need to cut down your virus trees because they're not going to um, cure itself. And so he said, no, 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 it'll, it'll cure itself, you know, don't cut it down. So what happens was my field being downwind of his field, I got wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I was cutting trees every week. I had like about seven, eight acres of papaya trees nice. here. Every week I would be cutting down trees mm -hmm. and it was just too much. So I moved on to the North Shore, find new land, virgin land again to escape the disease. Mm -hmm. But within five years, the same same situation. So a disease was just spreading. The pressure, virus pressure, was too much, and so it got to the point where Oahu was just wiped out, and we gave up. Just about gave up all the papayas on Oahu. What was the solution? Okay, the solution early on with the Dr. Gonzalez coming on with the cross protection, he worked with the University of Hawaii pathologists, guys like the, Dr. Ferreira, and they brought in the mild strain virus, which acted as a a cross protection system. We would inf uh, infect our seedlings with this mild strain virus in hopes that it would protect against the wild virus. And it worked, uh, but the, it was such a cumbersome system because we had to test each and every seedling to see if it was infected by the vi mild virus and it was just too much work. It's like vaccinating the plants kind of. Exactly, and you hear it with the flu, flu uh, yeah. viruses, cross protection, same, mm. same principle. Okay. And then uh, b because that system was a bit tedious, I mean, pain in the ass, really. Yeah, really, it was. Really. What, what was the next solution to that that was actually... Yeah, in the meantime, while they were working on it, they realized that this, this system was not the best. And so they were, again, with the molecular biologists at Cornell and all those other places, they were working on it and said, hey, listen, you know, why, why, why use the live virus? Just use the coat protein gene from that virus and work it in there. And so eventually they got that. They got a gene packet developed and they inserted the coat protein gene and then lo and behold resistant papayas you know? beautiful yeah. of the wrong color of the wrong color yes of right. course because of all the papayas that they tried to insert that gene only the red took ah. only the red took and so again because we don't grow we don't our customers prefer the yellow we had a big problem right. so university of hawaii again went back to the lab and made crosses with the that red papaya the transgenic red sun up papaya crossed it with the Kapoho variety, and that's what they had to trade, the rainbow papaya on all the markets and mm -hmm. all over the world. Uh, in my case, um, I, I can't grow a rainbow on this island very well, and so my customers are not used to that rainbow papaya. So one of the researchers were good and kind enough to say, we'll make crosses with your variety, the Camille line. And so we crossed the rainbow with the Camille line, and we got the La Yego, and that's what you see back here today. How do you spell La Yego? L-A-I-E, La Ie. That's where you see the La Ie uh, Polynesian Cultural Center, ah, right okay. in the same area. My Canadian tongue is, is tripping on the <laughs> Polynesian language. It's, uh, it's a bit difficult. So, um, you know, it's interesting because from what I hear then, this, uh, this GM papaya, it didn't just come out of nowhere. It was a solution to a specific problem. That's right. It has quantifiable results. That's right. Why is there such a negative reaction to it? You know, there, were a lot, there was a big campaign by these anti-GMO using it to get back to the corn people, I suspect. You know, they want the researchers and the corn companies. And so they're using the GM. And papaya it was the first fresh product to get cleared. You know, it took almost nine years for this uh, transgenic papaya to pass EPA, FDA, and USDA test. How many years? Almost nine years. Hmm. You know, it was tested in Waimanaal on the big island behind chain link fence, you know, and tested and thoroughly, you know. So what do you make of that argument that we don't know anything about GM and we never test it and it just gets put out into market? You know, again, there's, not, there's, there's nothing certain in the world. You know, I, when I, whenever, whenever I give a talk, I always ask him, how many of you have one of these in your hands? You know, everyone goes, uh, this never has been tested. This just came out, what, 10 years ago? How much radio waves is affecting your brains, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was to tell that to young people and I said, well, are you going to reject it? No. Right. Well, I mean, for me, you know, if I was lobbying against cell phones, it would, it would affect my life. I wouldn't have a cell phone yet. You know, the guys lobbying against GMOs, they don't seem to be farmers. Exactly. Because they're using us for 
different ends and again to attack the big companies right corporate you know america so how do you, and and there is that separation i mean you know you don't have to tell me what your feelings are about monsanto but like you know how do you feel about getting mixed in with the bad feelings about them oh no no you know months any i support all agriculture wherever i mean we we farmers we're out in the sun in the rain and working hard and getting blistered and all that you know we do this for our heart. We love to do farming. We and we feed people. We're not in it just for ourselves. We're in it for everybody else. So you know, it's not. It goes beyond all of this. And so, corporate farming has its own place, and they do a lot of research that helps us. Mm. All this uh, GMO stuff is coming out of that. Just mm. like NASA uh, spins by a lot of scientific data that industry uses. Right. So we need that kind of stuff. Right. What are some of the differences? Um, like we were on a we were on a Himsa Farms on Maui, and they're a very they're a small organic operation. Um, what's the difference? Like, what are some of the differences in operation between your farm and an organic operation? Okay, you know, early on when I started farming, you know, I realized this organic business is not going to make it here. I mean, there's just there's too much stuff. Okay, remember Hawaii is paradise. paradise. People come here. Everyone want to see Hawaii. They enjoy it. They like it. They like the weather. Everything else. And when you movement of people, you have hitchhikers and everything else. You have disease, insects, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff coming in. And as farmers, we've got to battle all of these. Some of them are very bad for our crops, specific crops. The latest one was the rhinoceros beetles that are going to kill all our coconut trees, you know. So, you know, about a month ago, they found a big coconut crab walking down the street, you know. And <laughs> I, so we, we have all these problems, so we need these tools and whatever we can have in our toolbox to survive and be farmers. Great analogy. So, I mean, when, when you think about GM technology, and I mean, you were in a situation where you, you had no other no choice. No other choice, really. exactly. Yet at the same time, you don't think of it as like, it's my only option. It's, it's just a tool. It's a tool, yes. We, you know, we, we, we did, you know, I was, uh, I graduated from University of Hawaii Agriculture. And, you know, we believe in science, research. And research will, you know, come up with answers and help, you know, the future. Yeah. So, yeah, we have to do that. Hmm. What do you make of this? Uh, what do you make of this argument that, uh, you know, all the researchers doing the research, they're they're all just getting paid by the USDA. <laughs> you know this, you know, and Dennis Gonzalez will confirm this. This was done all with private money, private efforts, not no government subsidies. You know, and the papaya industry itself, we banded together with the industry, we tax ourselves with a assessment to fund research yeah. and to promote and to make markets so we are working together it's not a subsidy thing we, i know if there's anybody giving out money hey i i want some yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know i've i've heard from a lot of uh, i've heard from a lot of uh, you know people who've been residents on the island for you know five six years and they've got a lot of opinions to share with me about monsanto and how it impacts their land can you tell me, based on the fact you've been a farmer, you're, you're, is it third generation? Third generation. Oh, no, I'm second generation. Second farmer. generation. Yeah. And with the third generation coming, coming up. Coming up. Can you explain to me your views of Monsanto's presence on the island? You know, Monsanto, Syngenta, Pioneer, all those guys are big corporate farmers. Just replacing Pineapple, Del Monte, Dole, and you know, the sugar company. Those lands were all in big corporate agriculture before. Sugar didn't make it because of world prices, and pineapple was sh being produced cheaper in Mexico and the Philippines, so there's no competition here. So, mm. again, they're replacing it with a better, higher value crop. Mm. So I, I cheer them on, hey, go for it. You know, they're, they're keeping the land in ag. And, you know, we sometimes we call it the, the, the green agriculture, the green open space. Right. Do you want houses there? That's what they're grumbling about. But, hey, I would have these farms out there then some big subdivision. Right. So in, in the 1950s, it took about 40% of Americans to, to make food. Like we were, it was 40% mm -hmm. of us growing food. Nowadays, it's about 2%. That's right. And it, it's, led to, uh, it's led to the average person having no knowledge of food and being exactly. very disconnected. That's right. What do you think are the consequences of that? You know, these people who have no connection to the farm lose sight of what's being done. What's, what technology is producing. And so they get all confused and, and they, they lobby for laws and regulations that just make it too rough for the farmers. And I, the, the, the fear of that is when young people say, I'm not gonna go into farming, there's too much trouble. Yeah. 
then we're going to come to a point where there's no food. Mm. Okay, Hawaii is very vulnerable. All, 80, 90% of our food comes in from the mainland, you know, or from someplace else. And so we're desperately trying to maintain our local supply. But yet, if you keep nicking away from these guys, who's going to produce it? Go to the open market. You see a lot of local fruits, a lot of local vegetables, and you cut their legs off, you're not going to have that. Mm. Okay? Papaya is a staple. We, I'm proud to be a papaya farmer. I have customers that have been with me 30, 40 years, you know, and they even die on us. Yep. And I say, hey, they, you know, I tell my son, what else can you ask for? You know, these guys are so loyal. Every week they come with their $20, buy their seven papayas. Every week they're waiting for us. You have to service them. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and that, that is a very interesting point. One of the things that I loved that Monsanto told us is, you know, we we're talking about their interests and like, you know, what, what, what's their purpose in being an egg? And, you know, it, it, it often boils down to a um, financial argument. But the thing that they said that was really cool is like, you know, we're getting back in touch with the fact that we're growing food as well. Um, I'm just wondering, how, how do you think we get people back in touch with food? I think, you know, it's an educational process where we just have to create more public uh, forum, public uh, demonstrations to say, hey, look, this food. Was... For example, we do a lot of demonstrating. My son loves it. He goes, whenever he has a chance, he goes out and demonstrates the papaya. Mm. And, you know, he cuts it up, serves it. We go to the farm fairs and serve it. And explain our story. And this is what needs to be done. These people, the young children need to be explained. You know, my grandchildren, they don't know it, but we bring them down to the farm. They love it down here. They need that connection. Mm. And so, you know, one time we have, were having problems with feral pigs. They come in the field, feed on the low growing papayas. And they're also contaminating the field, right? You know, feral pigs with their feces and stuff. Dirty. It's a very, you know, very, very bad. And so we captured one and he was injured, but I, ra I raised him and secured him. And then a reporter got wind of that and she came and interviewed me. She said, what are you going to do with this pig? Well, I'll probably raise them and eat them later on. And so she put it in a paper. And some young girl from the university someplace called, oh, Mr. Camille, you can't do that. God put this pig on earth. You can't hurt this poor animal. And I go, whoa, <laughs> where did that come from? OK. We all got to survive. We eat meat, we eat chicken, we eat eggs, we eat fruit. We got to do something. We can yeah. survive, right? I have a question. This one, you know, I, I was talking last night with a few people, and, and this is a question that I, I came up with, and I, I wanted to ask you this is, do you, as a, as a farmer and as, uh, as a father, is your, do you feel like your responsibility is to the land first or to your family and its well-being first? Well, I think, you know, that's a hard question, but to our family first, but the land is very important. The land is your base. If you don't take care of the land, you're not going to produce. Right. So the land and in Hawaii, the aina is called, referred to as aina, malama aina, love the soil. But the system surrounding this agriculture, the system of land tenure, land leases, land ownership, all impacts on it. You know, when I started, first started farming, they were giving me short-term leases, five years, two years. You know, you, a farmer is now forced into a system where if he wants to take money out, he's not going to put any in. Mm. So there's no more malama aina. Mm. We got to preserve the agricultural land in perpetuity so that farmers can do what they need to do to take care of the land. That's a, because that's your return. That's a great answer to that question. That is a great answer. Um, I mean, Ken, that's great. I mean, I appreciate your all time right. so much. Well, Thank you very much. All right. Fantastic.